Welcome back. We are in the book of Revelation, a wonderful, inspired, biblical book. And it is exactly what its name implies. A revelation of the future. This is what the book of Revelation is all about. Uh, the future with a focus on the second coming of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And in the first two sessions, we looked at the introduction and the structure of the book of Revelation in our first session. And in our second session, we looked at uh, the things that he saw because of the key in Revelation 1 verse 19, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. So in our previous session, we looked at the things which you have seen, what John saw and what did he see? He saw Jesus Christ. Uh, I need to remind you that when we go to the book of Revelation, we have to follow the structure of the book of Revelation. If I can take you back to where everything started, and that was when John was on the Isle of Patmos, he received a vision from the Lord concerning the church, concerning what will happen after the rapture, Revelation 4 verse 1, the seven-year tribulation, concerning the thousand years, and concerning the new heaven and the new earth. Let me remind you that John was here uh, on the Isle of Patmos um, and the Asian Sea, and we know that the Lord revealed it to him as a comfort to the churches in Asia Minor, which is located and was located in Turkey. So he was writing to all these churches there for a particular reason. And you will remember, I told you that the key to understand the book of Revelation, very, very important. If you miss it, it is not possible to explain the book of Revelation because it does follow a chronological order, a systematic order. And the key to understand the book of Revelation is clearly laid down by the Lord in verse 19 of Revelation 1. Write the things which you have seen, which was Revelation chapter 1. And the things which are, that is Revelation 4, um, uh, uh, 2 and 3, and then the, the things that will take place after this, that is Revelation 4 to Revelation 22. So the first section is Revelation chapter 1. The second section of the book is Revelation 2 and 3. And the third section of the book is Revelation 4 verse 1 to Revelation chapter 22. Very, very important that we understand it. I told you previously, and I need to remind you, that when we look at uh, the, uh, the image of um, what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, we do understand that it has to do with uh, the heathen nations ruling over the nation of Israel. And now, if I could put a time frame, because what we're going to do now, we're going to look at chapter 2, but you need to understand when we look at chapter 2 of Revelation, we are not looking at the 70th week of Daniel. We are not looking to the heathen nations reigning over, in that time over uh, Israel for the reason that we are looking now at the mystery of the church, the church era. In other words, what we see here is since Jesus died and raised from the dead until the rapture, we, in other words, we're looking at this period. After this period, this green period, we will go into the 70th week of Daniel and then to the thousandth year. So looking at this, if you can understand when you look at this, so this is Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. That happened in the day of John and what you see here playing out in the times of the fullness of the Gentiles to be fulfilled because we are in this time frame period and it's not fulfilled yet because we live in the church age. So when you look at this part of the image, we understand when we go here to the chronological order in dispensationalism, we understand we are here. So that green block brings you in this time frame period. Once you understand it, then you will understand why the church cannot go into the great 
uh, tribulation. The reason for it is that the church of Jesus Christ will be raptured before the Antichrist is revealed. So when the Antichrist is revealed and a false prophet to play out in the 70th week, that period of the 70th week of Daniel, though that particular era that they have to play out will take place after the rapture of the church in this particular time frame period. Once you understand that, then we can go and look at all the texts and understand it in biblical prophecy where it has got its place. So for now, we have to look at the second part or the second key that we have here. There's three keys to understand what you've seen, the things which are, and the things that, which will take place after this. And the things that are, is things that are in the day of John. What was those things? The church. So he was here uh, uh, in the Asian Sea. The churches existed in his day, and he had to write the letter that need to be sent to all seven churches. So Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 played out in the day of John. But we also understand, and we saw it in our previous session, it also, that, that uh, seven churches, transcends and covers the whole era of the church. In other words, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What I could have done, I could have made here seven points and I could have write the church's names in all that seven blocks. So, and I told you previously, if you to ask me where we are now, we are right here the church of Laodicea, right before the rapture and the second coming of Christ. So if you were to ask me, so what must still happen in the world events before Jesus would come? There could be only one answer. There's only one answer. And the answer that we, that we know is according to the fact that the church cannot be raptured until the last thing needs to take place concerning the church. And what is the last thing that needs to be uh, to take place concerning the church. Romans 11, 25. Verse 25. Why? Because that covers the fullness of the Gentiles. That is a specific number of the bride of Christ. And until the bride of Christ is complete, the rapture can't take place. So what we see here, yes, the rapture. The rapture can't take place until the fullness of the Gentiles has taken place. Then we read in verse 26, then Israel will be saved, but only at the end of the seven year, because Israel have to go through the seven year uh, um, uh, tribulation. Only then um, the Lord will come and Israel will be saved because the this, this stone kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven, when he comes, the millennium will be introduced. But before the millennium can be introduced, Jesus has to come for his uh, for his second coming. And the second coming is not the rapture because the rapture of the church and bring the church to an end, that happens seven years. So that's why we have the seven-year time frame period. And so once you understand that, then it becomes very, very easy to understand the chronological order of the book of Revelation, which means that chapter two and chapter three, so looking at that and looking at the rapture, if I had to ask you now, you come, you bring your finger, and you pinpoint where we are on this map. Where would you say on this schematic presentation, where would you say we are now? You have to come right here and say, according to this, we have to be here right before the rapture take place. Should we go here and we look at the spirit world and how things is playing out and you have to tell me where we are? You can't say we're in a thousand year peace because Satan is still here. He need to be bound and put into the bus. And that, this has not taken place yet. And so here, um, when Laodicea, the last church is uh, on earth, uh, which already existed in the day of John, but what happens in these seven churches will play out through the era of the church age. And that covers a 2,000 year church period. And that is where we are exactly tonight, um, right before the rapture. So that brings us to Revelation chapter 2. So we will look now to Revelation 2, and there's four churches that we will investigate. And then uh, in our next session, when we come together again, we will look at the, the Revelation chapter 3, which is um, the last three churches. So let's read together. And how I will do it now. 
we can read church by church separately. In other words, instead of reading the whole chapter, I also need to remind you something. I will read with you through the whole book of Revelation as we go through all these uh, sessions where we come together and discuss and look at the book of Revelation. Why? Because Revelation 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads. And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is we need to read it, we need to hear it, and we need to keep it. So we need to read every verse through the book of Revelation as we continue our journey together in the book of Revelation. So let's read of the first church, the seven churches. So here is the first. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolites, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen? Uh, I would like to make a few introductory remarks concerning the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, because this is the second part of Revelation 1 verse 19, the things which are, in other words, which is now, the seven churches. So Revelation 2 and 3 form that second division, the second section of this wonderful book, the book of Revelation. And these chapters, chapter 2 and 3, refers to what now is, the things which are. Are, as the King James Version rightly states. The reference, of course, was to the seven churches in Asia Minor at the time of John. And there's definite characteristics regarding these churches, uh, which today we know as Turkey. Okay? So the area of these churches uh, was in Turkey. And so these churches in the day of John, concerning them, I want you to give your attention to the following. Number one, there's a message from Jesus Christ to each church. And every message is different because every church is different. So every church has a message. The message incorporates the last words of Jesus Christ as we have it recorded in the Holy Scriptures. Do you understand that? It is the last time that Jesus ever spoke that is recorded for us in the Bible. It's here in the book of Revelation. And in every instance, it has a bearing on the visible church rather the invisible church. Meaning, the invisible church is a body of Christ comprising of all believers. But in the case of the visible church, it is a local church, a particular church that John, he knew these churches. And so what we see here is in this case, if it's a local church, it means there can be unbelievers present too in the local church. When we speak of the body of Christ in the whole world, 
Corpus Christi, we talk of the believers in Jesus Christ. When we talk of a local church, there can be believers and unbelievers. There's many people that just visit the church. But for the believers in the church, for his church, Jesus has a word for his own, for those that love him and know him. What I want you to notice, five of the seven churches, that's now Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. In five of those seven churches, there are aspects with which Jesus was not satisfied. He was not happy about it. Five of the seven churches, there were really things that he did not like. Bear in mind, in six of the seven churches, he found things that uh, was commendable. We note that the seventh church, Laodicea, the last church before the rapture, did not receive his approval. Bear in mind. As to the seven, all seven churches, there are four aspects. If you study Revelation 2 and 3 very diligently, very carefully, there's four things that you will notice in chapter 2 and 3 concerning the seven churches. And you must remember, it's also applicable to the church through all the ages. Let me remind you, although the seven churches exist in the day of John, each one of them, chronologically, from, from Ephesus to the last, the Laodicean church, also covers a span of the church era, the church age, which would be the main characteristic that is described to that particular church, be it Pergamum, be it Ephesus, be it Laodicea, be it Philadelphia. What is said there is applicable to a period in the times of the fullness of the Gentiles to be reached. So it has a double meaning. So here, I would like to bring under your attention the four aspects that's applicable to all seven churches. We discover in the Revelation 2 and 3 is number one, every letter has an introduction that refers to the glorified Son of God. It would be very interesting. I don't know if you ever noticed it, but if you take time and you read, like for instance, if you read to the angel of the church of Ephesus, these things says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That's what you saw in Revelation 1, a vision of the glorified Christ. And when he write to the church of uh, 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 Smyrna, these things say the first and the last who was dead and came to life. You read that in chapter 1. When you come to the church of uh, Pergamos, these things says he was the two-edged sword. So that you read in Revelation. So to every church, what is amazing, the glorified Son of God, the glorified Son, has, to, has something to say about himself to the church. Now bear in mind, that would mean that something about Jesus is speaking to the church, not only his words, but if you would read, him who has the stars and, and move about and walk in the midst of the lampstands, it says, I'm looking at you. I'm walking between you. And I'm taking note of what's happening in my churches. If he says, he who has a two-edged sword, it means, careful now, I've got words to speak. Or eyes like burning fire. I can see what's going on. Or feet like, uh, like brass and fire, which means judgment. So there's, there's very, very important things to realize that when we look at how Jesus presents himself to every church, it's amazing. So this is the first thing we notice as he was introduced in chapter one. So all of these refer back to chapter one. Secondly, concerning every one of these churches, all seven churches, Jesus said, I know your works. I know your work, I know your works, which means I know your deeds. I know what's going on. I can see what's going on. I walk between the churches and I know what's going on in my churches. The third thing that we recognize that is applicable to all seven churches as the words of Jesus regarding to all these churches 
Jesus said, to him who overcomes. So seven times you read, to him who overcomes. In other words, Jesus says, I have a message to everyone that belongs to me, to every child of mine, to every true believer, to every born-again Christian in my church, be it Ephesus, be it Smyrna, be it Pergamos, be it Laodicea, be it Philadelphia. I have a message. If you have an ear, hear what I have to say. And then, uh, fourthly, what is amazing is uh, the statement that uh, is addressed to every church. And that is, he was an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to these churches. In other words, if you can hear, listen to what I have to say. Open your ears and listen. So this is an admonition requiring obedience of the churches. I mean, since they were responsible to conform to what Jesus wanted them to be, it is required of every individual to conform to uh, the image of Jesus Christ and to love and serve his Lord. So I want you to take note. There is a basic structure in the case of the seven churches, but it was not necessarily held on to rigidly. In other words, yes, nevertheless, there is a structure. It is noticeable, um, namely a description of Jesus that's applicable to all seven churches. And secondly, there's a clear statement of whom the, address, the letter was addressed to. That's clear in all seven of these letters. And also, uh, it was followed by a recommendation. Um, or uh, it could be a disapproval and there will be judgment coming. Or what was unacceptable to, to Jesus or wrong. And of course, there's also an admonition or a promise from the Lord. So that brings us to the first church of Ephesus. We've just read about this church. So how would you describe the church of Ephesus? If I say to you, give me in half a sentence just a word about Ephesus, what would be your judgment call? I have two, uh, I have two that I can propose. When you study the church of Ephesus, you will realize we can either say this is a backslidden church, which is not a wonderful term to use, backslidden church. Or we can say the loveless church because Jesus was telling them, nevertheless in verse four, I have this against you that you have left your first love. There's a problem. Something happened in this church. So the letter was written to the church at Ephesus and it was a very important, Ephesus was a very important seaport city and it was the gateway to the Aegean Sea, which was one of the closest churches to where uh, John was on the Isle of Patmos, and uh, leading up to the countries um, of the Ephrates. And Ephesus was also well known, you would recall, in the book of Acts chapter 19, uh, known for the temple of the heathen goddess Diana, as you will recall in Acts chapter 19. Um, very interesting, Paul founded the church of Ephesus. That's one of his baby churches. Paul was the one that started the church, the apostle Paul. And now the apostle John has something to say to the church that the apostle Paul planted. Uh, I don't know if you know or realize, but Ephesus, the name Ephesus means to slacken or let go. To slacken or let go. Um, so, First of all, we also realize not only the name already tells us that there's a problem, you let go. Let go of what? Well, we discovered in verse 4 of your love. You don't love Jesus as you loved him previously. Things of the world has got hold of this church. But the description of Jesus Christ is very clear. As I told you, in all seven churches, we have a description of our Lord Jesus. And that, that, therefore we read, these are the words of him verse 2, uh, verse, the second part of verse 1, sorry, which says, who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walk among the seven lampstands. Refers to what John has seen in Revelation 1 verse 13. That's where he saw it, also in verse 20. So the focus of the description of the, of the glorified Jesus Christ is on the authority 
It is on the control that Jesus has over his churches. The fact that he has the stars in his right hand, the senior pastors of the churches, and he walk amongst the lampstands means I'm in charge. I'm in authority. This is my church. I mean, Jesus is the head of the church. The church is his body. It's his church. It doesn't belong to the devil. It doesn't belong to, to me and you per se. It belongs to him. We are part of his body. It is his body, the church. And God made him the head. And secondly, in verse 2, we notice, I know your works or your deeds. And so Jesus knows the works of a church, of the church of Ephesus and its labors and its patience. So, yes, but the recommendation of Jesus which follows is, yes, there's certain things that I can see that you do that I appreciate uh, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. So, false teaching, they wouldn't stand for that. This is one thing about the church of Ephesus. Well, it's a church that Paul founded. They are, they are built on the foundation of the truth of the word of God, of the teachings of the apostle Paul. And they will not stand any false teaching in the church. And for that, Jesus says, I can see it and I, and I recommend you for that. He says, but I also notice um, in verse 6 that you, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, very strong words, twice hate. The church hate those teachings, and I also hate it. And so these people were a specific group within the church trying to establish an order of priestly control over ordinary people. It's like a difference between clergy and laity. So they want to make a difference between those that are put on a pedestal and the rest of the brotherhood, our brothers and sisters. And Jesus says, I hate that because Jesus Christ is the high priest. And so, and, and he, he wants his whole church to have access to the Father through himself and not through priests or certain leaders. And therefore, when you, when you do an analysis of what the word means, um, the word means niku, to overthrow, and laos, which is laity. So what they want to do is they confuse the laity in the church and to overthrow and subject them to priestly control. It is people that want to take control in the church. And Jesus says, I hate that because that is not on. So they wanted to change the church um, into a priestly order of so-called priestly order uh, so that they can take control. And Jesus is not for it. He is for mutual brotherly love. We are all brothers and sisters equal in the sight of God. So their aim, of course, was to force a distinction between certain groups in the church. Well, there can be no distinction because in Revelation chapter 1, we've clearly seen in verse 6, all of God's children are kings and priests. I've made you kings and priests through the blood of the Lamb. We are all the same. All are kings and priests in the kingdom of God. And as we rightly see in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and we all share the equal right to approach God, not through a priest, but through one high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. We all can come to God through him. So the members of the body of Christ are brothers and sisters of each other, and we are all part of the one and same body of Jesus Christ. So there are nevertheless um, distinguishing gifts and ministries in the church that we know from Ephesians chapter 4 and also Romans chapter 12. And you can read it and study it for yourself. Of course, some as apostles or prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, of course. And there's gifts, helpers, and all these things in the church. But we're not talking about that. It's when people want to take charge over their own brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And the Lord says, I'm not for that. And But then Jesus in verse 4 tells the church of Ephesus, I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Wow. That is a problem. They have forsaken their love for Christ, which means the passion that they once had for Jesus is not there anymore. Something has happened. It seems that Christ, when we look at this, is not willing to allow 
a church that is guilty of this to continue down that path. He's not happy about it. And so he tells Ephesus that they should restore their first love. Ephesus could restore its first love. How? By complying with three directives of Christ that we see here, right here, uh, when you speak to the church. First, he tells them, number one, they had to remember what they had lost. He tells them, remember, in verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Remember where you come from, number one. Two, they had to repent. Turn back to what they had before. Turn back. And number three, they had to do the first deeds or works. He says, and I mean, it's clear in that verse, verse five. He says, I will come to you quickly if you don't do these three things because he have, I've just told you there's three things that he demand of the church and I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In other words, he's not going to stand for that. So there's a very strong admonition to a church. If you lose your first love, it states that to forsake their first love, it's going to be fatal to the church. It will be fatal. They had to repent to their former ways, how they know to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. If they refused to do so, there was a very real danger that their lampstand would be taken from them. And they possibly would cease to exist as a local church of God. And Jesus said, I will do that. But here's a wonderful promise to those that are faithful to the Lord. And he that walks amongst the lampstands, he tells him, and here's the promise, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which in the midst of the paradise of God. So they would receive the right to eat of the tree of life. This is a wonderful promise to those that's in the church uh, that if you are faithful and if you overcome, you will recall that in Genesis chapter 3, there was a restriction placed on the tree of life um, because of the fact that Adam and Eve have sinned and the Lord would put a cherubim on the eastern side of the Garden of Eden to make very sure that Adam and Eve uh, would not return to the tree of life and eat of that tree. But now we see it would no longer apply to those that are faithful to Jesus Christ. I will allow you to come and eat of the tree of life if you are faithful, if you overcome. That's a wonderful promise for me and you to, to bear persecution or uh, to be detested by people, um, to be laughed at because of who we are in Jesus Christ. But we will still declare his love and be faithful to him and serve him. Even if people, um, if they turn their backs on us, but if we keep on serving him faithfully, he will surely reward us that we can eat of the tree of life. That's his promise. I will give to that one, to him who overcomes, to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Here's a wonderful promise. Look at this. The tree of life that was here in the garden of Eden, the Lord says, I will give to you now because the paradise uh, uh, that has been moved away, but the tree, uh, the tree of life that's been moved back to heaven because we read in Revelation 2, I will give to you to eat of the tree of life which is in paradise. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says that paradise is now located in third heaven. So here we have a promise. If we here on earth are faithful to him, what he will do is he promise us that when we reach heaven, we will enter paradise and eat of the tree of life so that we can live forever and ever in the presence of God. That brings us to the second church, to Smyrna. And that church we know is the persecuted church. Please read with me from verse 8 to verse 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, 
let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So here, the letter was uh, written to the church at Smyrna. This city, Smyrna, was founded by Alexander the Great. It was a large trade center, an age-old port city to the north of Ephesus. And so the local church would be subject to severe persecution, uh, as the Lord rightly stated. I know this is going to happen, and it's happening to you. Because we also know the name Smyrna means myrrh. And it is a kind of ointment used for embalming those who died. We saw that in John chapter 19. And many martyrs died in the ages to come in Smyrna. Members of the local church were persecuted for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for this reason, the Lord emphasizes his death and resurrection uh, from the dead when he addressed the message to the church. You remember I told you uh, a few minutes ago that the glorified Christ appears something about him to every church. And did you note the description of the Lord Jesus Christ here in verse 8? He is the first and the last and came to life again. And he's telling that to the church that's going to die as martyrs. I am the resurrection and the life. So even though you die, here I am, I'm alive. You will live again in me. And that must have been a great uh, encouragement to the church. I know your works. You, uh, in other words, um, they had to know that he, Jesus, was very well aware of their circumstances. And so those who pretend to be something that were not uh, in the church, Jesus said, I know that you are part of the synagogue of Satan and belong to the devil himself. So consequently, there was an element of falling away in the church. And so what Jesus is telling them that suffering is only temporary. Should they be faithful unto death, they would receive a crown of life from Jesus himself. And what is so wonderful here is this is a very special crown, the martyr's crown, which will be given to those who have sacrificed their lives for Christ. People in all eternity in heaven uh, you need to realize this. Not only here in third heaven, but also when the new earth and the new heaven comes and the new Jerusalem come down, there will be people that will have crowns, the crown of life on their heads. And it will be a reminder in all eternity for people that see them to know that person, he died for the Son of God. For Jesus Christ. When you see that person with that crown, you will always be reminded that's one of those that were prepared to die for the Son of God, for the Son of Man. Wonderful crown that will be received by them. And so it is important to know that the Lord expects faithfulness from His church. The fact that Jesus said, I will give you the crown means well, some of you are going to die. You are going to pay a price. But think about it, that you will have this wonderful promise that if you are faithful and you would withstand persecution and, um, and you will not sacrifice your faith, but you will be prepared to die for your faith in me. You don't let go. You're not going to fall away. If you overcome, you will not be hurt by second death. This is very important. Not only will the martyr receive a crown of life, but the promise of Jesus here is that you, the overcomer who overcomes shall not be hurt by second death. And that takes us to Revelation chapter 20 verse 14, where we know that second death, in the Bible, second death refers to hell. Hades will after the white throne, the great white throne judgment, all those that are lost will be cast into the lake of fire into hell. And hell, the other name for hell, a descriptive name in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 20, is second death. To go to hell means to go to second death. So what Jesus is saying, if you are prepared to give your life for me, 
You will never go to hell. That's a promise. If you die for me, I save you from hell. I died on the cross for you. Now you die for me, you will live forever with me. And I will give you a crown. Not only will I make sure that you will never go to hell, but I will also make sure that you have a, the victor's crown, the crown of life. What a promise for those that are faithful. Um, we read of five crowns in the New Testament, in Revelation 2 verse 10, the crown of life, which is the martyr's crown. Uh, you can only receive that crown if you give your life for Jesus Christ. That's a very specific crown, the martyr's crown. The second crown that I would like to bring under your attention is 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25, the incorruptible crown, the crown that will last forever. That is also known as the victor's crown. And that is what, when Paul talks about this crown, he refers to those who take part in the race, the race of life, but also the, the race of the Christian life. In other words, um, faithful in your Christian life, if you are faithful day by day in loving and serving God, then you will be liable to receive this crown, the incorruptible crown. But you have to go, if you read carefully, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25, you have to go strictly according to the rules. Not your rules, God's rules. The Bible tells us how to live a Christian life. And if we follow that path, if this is the way we go, there's a wonderful promise for those. There's also the soul winner's crown in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, or as also known as the crown of rejoicing. That this crown is for those who win souls for Jesus. They will receive this crown, the soul winner's crown. Also, we see in 1 Peter 5, verse 4, the crown of glory that will never fade away. And we know it also as uh, when you read in the context of the verse, the shepherd's crown. The shepherd's crown speaks of the crown that will be awarded to pastors and shepherds of the flock of God that has been overseers in God's work and they have been faithful in ministry. Not to lord over the flock, but to lead in love and to love the flock. They will receive this wonderful crown. And lastly, we also read in the New Testament, of course, there will be many more crowns, but what the Lord has revealed to us is also the crown of righteousness, which you read uh, in uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse, 4, uh, 2 verse 8. The crown will be awarded to believers who have maintained the expectation of the second coming of Jesus Christ, ready for the coming of Christ. Why? Because, you know, if you expect Jesus to come, you live different than somebody that don't live like that. Because if you look very carefully at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 3, where the Bible says, well, now we are children of God and we know that when he appears, we will be like him. And then verse 3 clearly states that if you live a clean, holy life as, as he is holy, then there is a wonderful and great reward. So for instance, if you know Jesus is coming soon, you live as someone expecting him to come. So you live with, uh, being ready for Jesus to come. You don't want to live in sin. You don't want to live far away from him. You want a relationship with him. You want to be close to him and that there's intimacy between you and him, between you and your Lord. And to live a life like that is to live with the expectation that Jesus come and he can come every day. Now, people that live like that, they have a very strong evangelistic view of life because they want to reach as many souls as they can to bring them into the kingdom of God. So they have a different outlook on life, not thinking, oh, well, one day he's coming. I don't know when he's coming. They are ready. So there is a, there's a tension inside of them. Uh, it is like a string that you pull on both sides. And so that, uh, there's, a, there's a tension of an expectation. Maybe it's this year. Maybe it's this month. Maybe this week. It can be any moment that Jesus can come. And I want to be ready. And people that live like that, they shine in the kingdom of God. And for them, Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, there's a particular crown known as the crown of righteousness. Now we have the third letter to Pergamum. And this is the church that compromise, or as some people would call it, the compromising church. If you would, you can read with me from verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Can you see again? Something that you saw in Revelation chapter one. Every time you have something 
that he saw in the glorified Son of God. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed amongst you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put the stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you have uh, those who hold, you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Very, very wonderful. Promise that Jesus gives his church. Uh, something about Pergamum, the city there at Pergamos. It was seen as a, the city as a seat of riches, fashion, culture, and education. Um, and we know that the God of medicine was worshipped there in the time of John. And there was also additional worship to a live snake that we know from history that that was what happened in that city, in that place. And here the church was recognized as having, an, in that city, an elevated standing in the world. People would adore the church. In other words, what we find here is the problem. Let me, let me go this road first. The word pagamum refers to marriage. Okay? Remember that. A marriage. The church of Jesus Christ in Pergamos married the world. The church has compromised. It went into a marriage relationship with the world. So the church would not expose the sins of the world where we are the light of the world and we had to speak the word of God. The church, they, uh, that is the church that compromised. And that would, of course, be a church that uh, was a symbol of uh, a wayward, licentious church. And therefore, Jesus says uh, that he is coming, he's coming to them with a two-edged sword. I come with my sword. There's going to be problems. Uh, and I do know your works. And he said, I can see everything, the all-seeing eye of Christ. And, and of course, he says, yes, I do see that there's some people that are faithful to me who have not renounced their faith in me. But, he says, I can even see that Antipas, one of your brothers, a very specific brother in the local church, he was put to death because of his faith in Christ. And because of that, some people would not renounce their faith in Christ. But the rest of the church, they went into compromising with the world, married to the world. And, and Jesus said, I can actually see what's going on there. And that is that Satan has tried to erect his throne in the church. Because we know that the throne of God on, uh, on the ark, the ark of the covenant, and in the glory of God, but in contradiction uh, to that, we see that Satan has his throne in Pergamos. And with the devil has got a stronghold. Let me tell you something. What we do understand from this is, if you go into compromise, you are giving the devil a foothold. You compromise, you give the devil a seat. The Lord says, the devil has a seat there in the church, and I can see it clearly. And so Jesus says in verse 14 and verse 15 that he will rise up in, in judgment uh, against those who upheld the doctrine of Balaam. Well, I need to remind you, you know the story of Balaam in Numbers uh, chapter 31. Peter would also explain it in 2 Peter chapter 2. And that was the, where, where Balaam made it very clear to Balak um, when, when Balak asked Balaam to curse the people of God, God said, you can't do it. So he did not do it. But to eventually receive money to go into a compromising situation, what Balaam did eventually, he told Balak that, uh, that, he, that he, can, he can show Balak how to bring the people of God to a fall. He tell him, let them marry with the Moabites, the woman of Israel, 
And then they will start worshiping the idols of Moab. And when they start worshiping the idols, he says, then God will rise up against his own people and he will kill them, which happened. And because of that, the Lord says, I hate that teaching. So there are people, they, there are still those who lead people astray with doctrines that cause unfaithfulness to God. And so, and the Lord says, but I can also see the doctrines of the Nicolaites is also there. You're also trying to establish a priestly order in the church, and I'm not happy for that. And so, what Jesus is saying in verse 16 to his church is, you better repent, or else I will come against you quickly, and I will fight against those people with the sword of my mouth. I will not tolerate it. Very clearly, the Lord made this statement. Uh, either you repent or you will be judged by the word of God and by the sword of the Lord. And then the Lord gave a threefold promise. If you are faithful, let him who has an ear, let him hear. And firstly, what we see here for the overcomer is you will eat from the hidden manna. Now we know that, of course, will be like the tree of life in paradise. It will be in paradise, meaning that I will take care of all your needs. And I will be your provider. I will be El Shaddai. I will take care. I will be your provider. Because in the Old Testament, God gave them food to eat. He gave them manna so that God was taking care, uh, provision. He made provision for his people. So the, the, the promise of the hidden manna ensure the overcomer that God will supply all their needs. And the second promise that the Lord gave uh, refers to a white stone which was given to those who achieved a victory. In other words, there will be a name on the stone and you will receive a stone and on that stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. What is amazing here is the Lord says, I will give you a new name in heaven. Maybe you don't like the name your mother or your father gave you. Maybe you never laughed at it. But wherever and whatever, the fact of the matter is, God knows your life on earth. Now, nobody has walked in my shoes. Let me tell you, in all my life, in 60 years of my life, I walked in my own shoes. Which means, by way of saying, nobody has the experience that I had exactly. Nobody lived my life for 60 years except myself. So the life that I lived, what I went through in life, what I have gone through in life, all my life, things that happened to me, and, 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 and how I served the Lord, where I fall, where I stood up, everything that I went through in life, whatever took place in my life, and whatever God has done in my life, everything that I went through in life shaped me, made me who I am, and and only God knows who I am. And because he knows who I am, he can say to me, this is your name. This is your name. And when you hear that name, you will know it's you. So when you get to heaven and you hear that name, only you have that name. Because only you had the experience you had in life. Nobody else lived your life. So there's a promise. Jesus says, I will give you a new name. And that new name described you exactly who you are. Amazing that God is going to give us that name. And one day, an angel is going to tell you in heaven that God is calling you. And when you hear that name, you will know it's me. And you will go to the throne of God because he knows you. He knows your life. That name is descriptive of who you are. So, yes, of course God gave a new name. He gave a new name to Abram, Abraham. He gave a new name to Jacob, Israel. And because of their experiences, remember... That name that was given to people in the Bible, when the Lord would give them a new name, it was because the new name was given to people when such people like Abraham and Jacob and whoever, they gained commendable victories in spiritual battles. The life they lived. The Lord, when, 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 when Jacob battled with the Lord, uh, with the angel of the Lord in his tent. Um, so, and because of that, the Lord gave him a new name because he conquered and the name is Israel. So God has a new name for you. Brings me to the fourth and the last church in chapter two. And that is the, in the fourth letter to Thyatira. The church that has grown 
careless, or as some people would describe it, the corrupt church. Let's close with this church. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, sacrifice, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the deaths of Satan as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Wonderful, wonderful promise to this church. The letter written to this church, uh, in this city, the city was situated uh, to the northeast of Pergamum, and it was built as an industrial city, just to know um, the situation of the people that were there. And the description of Jesus Christ, again, a description of the glorified Jesus Christ, in this instance, has, you can see there's something very, very different that you would see in other places. These are the words of the Son of God. Very seldom in the whole of the Bible you will read the Son of God where he calls himself. The Son of God is now speaking to you. Very clearly. The Son of God is speaking now to you. Very directly. And he says, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. And of course, this is a reference to Revelation 1 verse 14 and 15 as we've seen a few weeks ago. So the symbolism of the vision speaks of judgment. He comes as one to judge. And the fact that he used the title, the Son of God, that's the most profound description of Jesus Christ you can ever find in the Bible. And usually he would refer to himself as the Son of Man. But in this instance, uh, he would refer to himself as the Son of God. And he says, I know your deeds. Again, he confirms, I know what's going on there. He says, yes, I know about your love, your service, your compassion, your faith, your perseverance. I know. But, from verse 20 to verse 23, there are things that are very wrong in the church, and I know what's going on. The local church was being, has been controlled by Jezebel with a false teaching. And she reminds us of Jezebel, uh, the wife of King Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16. And Jezebel was the most influential woman in the church and called herself a prophetess and falsely claimed to have received revelations or prophecies from God to the people in the local church. And the Lord says, I have uh, uh, against this woman for what she's doing. So in this church, we find that something very interesting. In Pergamum, uh, when the Lord speak about Balaam and he used the illustration, that it was things outside the church that come to influence the church. When you really see trouble is when trouble is inside the church. And Jezebel was inside the church. So the pressure was not from outside. She was inside the church. You see, the church is really in deep waters when the problem is inside the church. When the, ch when the problem is outside the church, the church can stand against it in the name of Jesus. But once the problem is inside the church and the infighting is inside the church, you have corruption. And this is why the Bible teaches us here, we can see that this church is a corrupt church. And so, and what the Lord is saying is that he will surely, uh, he will come this, uh, and he reveals there's an impending judgment. His eyes like fire. And his feet like burnished brass. And so those that are contaminated by the teaching of this woman, he will surely judge them. So yes, maybe when we look back 
to Ephesus, we realize that the members of the church of Ephesus, they were weak in love, but strong in teaching, in the doctrine. In this instance, we find that this people, there's love, but there's a lot of false teaching. And so the Lord cannot tolerate one of these two things um, in a situation like this, in these two churches. In other words, both of these extremes had to be avoided in the church because the church had to speak the truth in love. This is how God wants to see his church. Speak the truth and do it in love. Love without truth is not good. Truth without love is not good. You need both. So in the historical setting of this church, it represents a terrible period in the history of the world in the church from 600 to 15 after Christ. But here is a wonderful promise of Jesus in closing to those who overcome and would be steadfast until the return of Jesus. And the promise was that they would take part in the messianic millennium reign of peace with power over the nation. So what the Lord is saying to the church here, the church, um, he says, he's telling this church, if you are faithful, when my thousand year peace come, you will reign with me. You will be in my kingdom to reign. And what a wonderful promise that if I'm faithful now, when we get to the thousand year reign, when I receive a crown from the Lord, I can reign with Jesus because I've been faithful in this life to him. So in other words, they would reign with Jesus, but then those who would be found faithful and overcome, they would also receive Jesus Christ himself because he says, and they will receive me referring to himself. When you look very carefully, he says, and I will um, myself, they will receive me. So as we read through Revelation chapter 2, we realize something here. What we realize is when Jesus says, uh, at the end of that, uh, of that church, uh, as we read from verse 26, he says, to him who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power of the nations. And he clearly says, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. I also have received from my father and I will give him the morning star, which means myself. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this church has a promise. And so let's look at the four churches in closing this way. Ephesus, you are not to lose your passion for Jesus Christ, but love him. To Smyrna, if you overcome, you will not be hurt by second death by hell. To Pergamum, if you do not marry the world, then I will give you to eat of the hidden manna and I will give you a new name written on the stone. And to this church, the fourth, if you hold fast to the truth, I will give you myself the morning star, which is the bright morning star, as we see in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I'm reminded of a question and answer sequence I once read. And the question was, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? And the answer came, I don't know and I don't care. Now, this is the way a lot of people feel about the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. They don't know and they don't really care. An apathetic Christian is a cynical one. A person who simply doesn't care anymore about the signs of the times. But me and you, we have the prophetic teaching of the scripture very clearly in the word of God. Luke chapter 21 verse 36 where Jesus says, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus says, if you are faithful, you will escape with the rapture and all these things that came to pass, we will escape. If we are faithful, we will be part of when Jesus comes to take his church away. God bless you. Next week, we will look at Revelation chapter 3. Amen. Amen.